Hi, I'm Jonah Davies from the University of Washington in Seattle. And today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, shoulder arthroplasty options for trauma sequelae. Here's a case of a 46-year-old male uh, who fell while cycling. This is a very active patient who likes to go on long hikes and bicycle rides. And he was treated by one of my colleagues. And so you'll see here, he has a four-part head split fracture dislocation. And we know that these are extremely high risk for uh, avascular necrosis. And after a long discussion with the patient, ultimately he chose open reduction internal fixation. We know that these can be very challenging cases. Here, the patient underwent operative fixation with a plate and screw construct. Uh, they were able to restore normal anatomy of the tuberosities and the humeral head, although it was quite difficult due to the head split getting good access and good visualization, as well as good fixation. Um, the patient actually did very well early uh, postoperatively, was uh, having minimal pain, had started physical therapy, started gaining range of motion, and sometime between the six and 12 week mark, his pain started increasing. He returned to clinic and was seen, started to have these protruding screws through the humeral head. And we know that AVN after open reduction internal fixation is anywhere between 30 and 68%, specifically with these four part fracture dislocations. Unfortunately, as these patients are quite young, there aren't many other options available acutely, and so it still is our best treatment option. We know that this patient had beginning pain, and then as he evolved over time, his range of motion decreased, and he started having early glenoid wear. So when I saw the patient in clinic, uh, we obtained new x-rays, which demonstrated uh, what we can see here. And so at that point, I obtained a CT scan. And really what I'm looking for on the CT scan is, are the tuberosities healed? Are the remaining fractures healed? And is there any early glenoid wear? And so on the coronal plane here, you can see that the tuberosities are actually in a very good place. They look healed, at least the greater tuberosity looks healed. You can see subsidence of the, of the humeral head with about five or six millimeters of step off at the lower end of the uh, humeral head. And when I look on the axial view, you can see the early glenoid wear, probably from the screws protruding and eroding into the glenoid. And so after discussing with the patient, you know, we talked about multiple options, one being just re uh, removing the screws and allowing everything to heal and, and going at a later date. Another option would have been uh, to do a hemiarthroplasty uh, with a longer stem to protect the fracture. And then uh, two other options were a stemless uh, humeral head replacement, which is what we'll talk about here, and a reverse shoulder. Uh, unfortunately, at this patient's age, I tend to not want to do a reverse shoulder arthroplasty, and the patient was understanding this. And so ultimately what we chose was to do a, a stemless total shoulder arthroplasty. So this was done in about four months. At that point, we decided to do a resurfacing of the glenoid as well due to the patient's erosions on the CT scan. And so this specific patient had a delta pectoral incision done previously. So that's what we used to go back in and then identify the plate. And then staying right on the plate, I elevate all the scar tissue right off the plate and try to get a retractor in uh, laterally. At that point, we trace back proximal, try to make sure that we're in the right plane between the deltoid, the subacromial space, and the uh, rotator cuff, and then carefully elevate the scar tissue off of that. At that point, we're able to put a deltoid retractor in there and fully expose the uh, humeral head. Now, one of the things that comes up is how to manage the subscapularis to dislocate the humerus. And generally speaking, for total shoulder arthroplasty, I use a lesser tuberosity osteotomy. However, in these cases, especially in the post-trauma cases, for an eclipse, I will do a subscap peel as I want to maintain as much bone preservation as possible. And so here you can see on the post-op imaging, we've recreated the normal Shenton's line. Um, with the eclipse and uh, the shoulder is well centered on the axial as well. Now, this patient came back at about 12 weeks. Um, things I'm looking for are, you know, is Shenton's line well, well preserved? Is there no uh, proximal migration? Is the humeral head in line with the glenoid component? And also are the tuberosities healed? This patient was extremely happy because he had, uh, he was miserable preoperatively and, and came back at 12 weeks with absolutely zero pain. And as you can see, um, he has very good range of motion. And, you know, this is a very active patient. He has about forward elevation of 140 and internal rotation to about L2 and external rotation to 70 degrees, which is very comparable to his other side. So he's only at 12 weeks. He's extremely functional, uh, very happy with his result and, you know, starting to live life again. And so 
you know, in summary, I think the Eclipse can be a very useful tool for um, these types of patients where they've undergone operative fixation of a bad proximal humerus fracture, especially the younger patients, but they've ultimately gone on to AVN. And so one of the issues is you have to be able to evaluate tuberosity healing. I wouldn't do a stemless implant if the tuberosities weren't healed or had displaced. But if they're healed, as you can see on the CT scan preoperatively, uh, then I think it's an excellent option. The CT scan can also be used to plan with the VIP and can help uh, pick and choose which screws need to be removed from the plate. When doing these earlier, I think it's safer to leave the plate on because you really want to protect the fracture. The last thing we want is to take this, the plate and screws out, do a stemless implant and have some uh, um, periarticular fracture. And so leaving the screws can be done very easily, proximally and distally, and just removing the ones that would interfere with the Eclipse implant. As you see, the results can be quite good. So I think the other thing to remember is this implant, if ever it does fail in the future, will be an extremely easy uh, revision to reverse. And, and so really using a stemless implant for this type of problem allows early function, early range of motion, and minimal intervention on the humeral side. So in summary, I think the Eclipse is an excellent uh, implant for this type of problem, can restore patients' function uh, and bring them back to their activities as soon as possible. Thank you for listening.